Hello everybody, uh, welcome to this week's North Clare Community Church Sunday service. Uh, what a blessing it is to be able to come together uh, to hear God's word and to praise the name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour, uh, our Lord and Saviour. Um, and for anybody watching today, uh, maybe there are people who are not Christian who are just watching in, um, I just want to encourage you that there is great hope you know, in this time of trouble. Um, because this world is going through a terrible, uncertain time and people are filled with worries of all sorts, you know, not, not sure what's going to happen in the future. And I just want you to know there's great hope in Jesus Christ. You know, you might look on and think to yourself, well, what's the story with these Christians that um, they can rejoice and be happy and sing songs of praises, even in these times of trouble, you know, when there's all sorts of uh, worries going on and different different turmoil in the world. Um, so I'm gonna, I'd just like to read one small piece of scripture. Uh, just give you an idea of what the joy a Christian has in their heart. So it is Philippines 4, 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Praise God. So that's just an excerpt from uh, Paul's letter to the Philippines, and it gives you an idea, you know, Christians have uh, such hope and such joy that they can rejoice even through troubles and persecutions, and that we'll always have hope, because we know there's something much better to come. Uh, so as we continue with the Sunday service, I pray that your heart will be moved and that you will call on the name of the Lord in your day of trouble, and he will answer you. So I uh, hope you're blessed now today. Uh, God bless you and your families, uh, and I hope you enjoy the, the service. God bless. Good morning. We're going to sing, raise a hallelujah, because the Bible talks about the sacrifice of praise. Giving thanks from our lips is a sacrifice that God is pleasing to our Creator, our God, our Savior. And we're going to sing, uh, raise a hallelujah, and let's let's sing it together. Here we go. Why well, raise a hallelujah in the presence of his majesty? I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah, my weapon is. My weapon is my melody I raise a hallelujah Heaven comes And heaven comes to fight for me And I'm gonna sing In the middle of the storm Louder and louder Can you hear my praises roar Hope will arise Death is defeated King is alive Hallelujah I raise a hallelujah With everything inside of me I raise a hallelujah I will watch the darkness flee. I'll raise a hallelujah in the middle, in the middle of the mystery. I'll raise a hallelujah. Fear you've lost, and fear you've lost your hold on me.
the king of your life. Sing a little louder. Oh, sing a little louder. We will. We're gonna sing a little louder. Join me. Raise a hallelujah. Let's join. Let's sing together. Raise a hallelujah. Raise a hallelujah. Oh, sing a little louder. In the presence of His majesty, sing a little louder. Praise you, Lord. You're worthy of all our praise, Lord, at all times. Hallelujah. Amen. Hello, boys and girls. I hope and pray you're doing well today. Well, today I've got a very special guest with me. Uh, his name is Percy. This is Percy. And, of course, we've got Levi with us. Say hi, Levi. Hi. And, uh, but Percy is a very good friend of ours. He's, he's a really good... If you haven't noticed, he's a parrot. You can see he's got a beak and he's got this lovely hair and he's got this lovely feathers and his eyes is a really nice part. But we've trained Percy to speak. He's one of those speaking parts. But Percy, uh, we tried to teach him lots of different things, but the only thing that can come out of his mouth is this. What's, say something, Percy. For his steadfast love will last forever. Say that again. For his steadfast love will last forever. For his steadfast love will last forever. That's the only thing that he can say. Isn't that right, Percy? <laughs> Here we go. Okay, which is really cool because that's very handy because today we're looking at a psalm, Psalm 136. And it actually says that in the psalm. It's really cool. Uh, shall we read it? Will we, guys? Okay. So Psalm, first one, it says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his steadfast love will last forever. Thank you, Percy. And as a, this psalm is all about saying thank you to God for all the wonderful things he does and for who he is. Uh, and the next one says, give thanks to the God of gods. For his steadfast love will last forever. Good job, Percy. Next verse, verse 3 says, 
Give thanks to the Lord of Lords. For his steadfast love will last forever. Very good. Thank you, Percy. To him alone does great wonders. For his steadfast love will last forever. Uh, to him who by understanding made the heavens. For his steadfast love will last forever. To him who spread out the earth above the waters. For his steadfast love will last forever. Isn't that really cool? Everything he made is because he loves us. Isn't that right? What do you say to that, Percy? For his steadfast love <laughs> will last forever. That's right. To him who made the great lights. For his steadfast love will last forever. The sun to rule over by day. For his steadfast love will last forever. The moon and stars to rule over by night. For his steadfast love will last forever. That's right. Thank you, Percy. And you know what else? We can, be, we can think about all the things that, that, that God has done for us. And you know what? You know, it's good to do that. It's a really good thing to say thank you. Uh, for instance, we can say thank you, God, for sending us your son. Isn't that right? For his steadfast love will last forever. That's right. And thank you, Jesus, for going to the cross for us. For his steadfast love will last forever. <laughs> and thank you for rising from the grave. For his steadfast love will last forever. And thank you for the hope in my heart. For his steadfast love will last forever. Thank you for the love that you give us. For his steadfast love will last forever. <laughs> and thank you, Lord, that your promises are true. For his steadfast love will last forever. And we can say thank you for giving us family. For his steadfast love will last forever. Isn't that great to think that God gives us family because... For his steadfast love will last forever. It's God's love that he gives us our family and for friends. Thank you, God, for friends. For his steadfast love will last forever. Yes. And here, verse 25 in Psalm 136 says, He who gives food to all flesh. For his steadfast love will last forever. Very good. And then the last off, it finishes, Give thanks to the God of heaven. For his steadfast love will last forever. Hey, isn't that great? Percy, you are one clever parrot. For his steadfast love will last forever. Uh, is there anything else you would like to say? For his steadfast love will last forever. <laughs> Very, I think, Percy, you've said it. You Actually, you have said it perfectly well. And Levi, thanks for today as well. Bye-bye, Percy. And bye-bye, Levi. Okay, God bless you guys. See you later. Good morning, church. Uh, thanks for worshiping with us this morning. Uh, we're delighted to have you and uh, pray that you've been blessed already. Also that you're looking forward to the to the word now in a moment. I believe God's going to speak to us. Uh, first of all, I've got some uh, announcements uh, for the week ahead. Um, I suppose the big news is, as probably most of you are aware, that the government have revised the regulations, the guidelines for public worship. And uh, so we are delighted to hear that. And uh, we... We're looking forward to getting back together again. So we're um, liaising with the community centre in regard to that. And but just to let you know that it's not going to happen next week. Next week's service will still be online, and um, but we'll keep you updated as to when we can get back together again. And uh, just some other announcements for the week ahead. Then uh, tomorrow morning, Monday morning, the ladies are meeting uh, for a time of prayer. And you can contact Rachel and she'll give you the relevant Zoom details for that. So I'll be online as well. Time of prayer for the ladies tomorrow morning. And I think they're going to do alternate Monday and Tuesdays. But Rachel will keep you informed in regards to that. And um, then on Wednesday night, we have the cell groups again meeting. So I encourage you to be a part of that. Uh, we had a great time. We all came together uh, last uh, Wednesday night. And had a lovely time for the breaking of bread service. Uh, but this coming Wednesday will be in our cell groups again. So contact your cell group leader and uh, be a part of that. And I'm sure you'll be encouraged and blessed. And uh, this week, the Food for You ministry continues, both in Anastayman and Kirosh. So if you're interested in helping with that, 
um, contact Tanora regarding Emma Steinman and Brian regarding Kilgosh. And please continue to pray uh, for this uh, ministry. And uh, as I say, next week, the service will be online again. Uh, but we'll keep you updated as things um, change in regards to that moving forward. And uh, finally, just if you'd like to donate uh, to the ministry here, then you can do so via the website. And we want to thank you to everyone who's contributed um, to the ministry here. And uh, But there's donate, uh, donation uh, details on the website. And uh, so you can get that on the homepage of the website, North Clare Community Church. All right, so God bless you. And uh, we'll see you soon. to give you on Reher Day. Welcome to the reading of God's Word. Today we're going to pick up on the book of Hebrews towards the end of the Old Testament. And the last time I was looking at Hebrews chapter 9, the first part. So I'd love if you would join me in reading Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 11. We're going to take up from verse 11. So the background to this was the last time we studied the first part of Hebrews, we looked at how the Old Testament tabernacle during the time of Moses was a vivid illustration to the people, demonstrating many spiritual truths about God. So today we're going to look at what the Old Testament tabernacle and the high priest and the sacrifices, we're going to look at what they meant and what they pointed towards, and that is the ministry of Jesus Christ, the ultimate and real High Priest. Before we get started, let's ask a question. Did you ever have somebody do something for you that you could never do for yourself? Well, sometimes one person can do something for a whole nation. In fact, one person can represent a whole nation. If you think back to the summer of 2000, and 12. I remember there was one person who represented Ireland in the London Olympics and that was Katie Taylor. She won the gold medal and it was reported that Ireland had won a gold medal. Now not every single person in Ireland had gone to the London Olympics. Not every single person fought for that victory, but she did it on our behalf. So when they said that Ireland, that, that Katie Taylor won a gold medal, it was like Ireland won a gold medal. And she did it on our behalf. And that's the concept that we're going to be looking at today. How one person's victory was counted as everybody's victory. It's an illustration of how when Jesus came to earth as our representative to pay for our sins, it was a decisive victory by our Redeemer and it was accepted by the courts of heaven, by the courts of justice in heaven as eternally valid. So the death of Jesus and his entrance into heaven, when he entered into heaven, he entered as our representative and our mediator. And this means that we can now enter into God's presence. So let's read more about this in detail as we take up from where we left off at in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 11. And it says, But when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands, that is to say, not part of this creation. Verse 12. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he, he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. 
So how much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death, so that we may serve the living God? We'll just stop there. Now, as good as illustrations are, they're, they're never as good as the real thing. Now, I have a illustration here back in the 1990s. And, and sorry, before I get into that, why am I talking about an illustration? It's because the Old Testament tabernacle and its furnitures and the high priest and the sacrifices, they were illustrations pointing to something. And so I'm now going to give an illustration from my own life from the 1990s. Remember those days with mullets and uh, uh, the different pop songs that were on at the time? Well, I remember um, I was courting my wife-to-be and uh, she she went over to Spain. She was working in Spain for a year. Now, that was a bit difficult for me, but I carried a photograph of her uh, in my wallet and that was that was a, a representation of my wife uh, but um, I couldn't I couldn't uh, though it was a representation and though it was an accurate representation the photograph of my wife-to-be um, it wasn't as good as the real thing obviously um, I couldn't talk to it to the photograph. I couldn't um, I couldn't hold hands with the photograph. I couldn't have a meal out together with the photograph. <laughs> so it wasn't as good as the real thing, even though it was an accurate representation. So I'm just using a, a light-hearted illustration here that so too the Old Testament tabernacle and its sacrifices, they were good illustrations of what was to come. But they in themselves were not the real thing. And that's why Jesus never served as a priest in a man-made temple, uh, which was only a representation of the heavenly temple. No, after his resurrection, Jesus entered heaven's courts for real as our representative, presenting the victory of his death as the full and final payment to to bring people back to God. So he did this in reality. So what the Old Testament pointed towards, he did it for real. So it's like the Old Testament was like a photograph or uh, yeah, like that photograph, um, but not the real thing. It was pointing towards the real thing. So Jesus came as in reality, in history, as our Redeemer. And what the Old Testament pointed towards, he did it in reality. When we think about this payment that Jesus made, I, I don't think I don't think we humans realize how how serious sin and selfishness is. The Old Testament sacrifices point out that sin is deadly serious and it leads to death and eternal separation from a holy and pure God. So it's just like today when, when, whenever we break bread, we do the breaking of bread, we share communion. Uh, we are looking back at what Jesus did in history. We look back on his sacrifice on the cross. And so too the Old Testament believers, they looked forward to when Messiah would come and when he would deal with their, their enemy. And maybe they didn't realize he was first of all going to deal with their greatest enemy, which was their own sin. Let's pick up on the passage in verse 15. It says, for this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, a new agreement, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. So I'd like to look at this promised eternal inheritance that Jesus bought for us. 
Did you ever inherit something? So here's, a, here's another illustration. Did you ever, did you yourself ever inherit something? Well, I was speaking to a man a few weeks ago and he told me that he once received a letter from a, 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 from a lawyers, I suppose, or solicitors or something, telling him, <laughs> it's an amazing letter to get a letter like this, telling him that he inherited 100,000 from a distant relative, uh, an old lady that he he never he, he never knew of, or he might have vaguely known. But anyway, this lady was the sole heir of a, a very large business. Uh, she died; she had no children, but in her will, a portion of her fortune was left to forty-six distant or extended relatives. So, as the saying goes. Where there's a will, there's a relative. <laughs> now, but I thought that was interesting um, talking about inheritance and talking about wills. Like it is amazing if you were left something, something just given to you. And isn't it amazing that God has given us an inheritance? But let's look at this idea of wills. Um, if you if you ever have been at a reading of a will, um, you know that it only comes about when somebody has died. So let's pick this up um, in verse 16. In the case of a will, it is necessary to prove the death of the one who made it, because a will is in force only when somebody has died. It never takes effect while the one who made it is living. So here's an example. If I said to you, I'm, I'm going to leave you uh, my watch when I die. I'm going to leave you my watch. It's going to be your inheritance. And you said, oh, that's great. I'll take that now. Thanks a million. I'll, I'll take it now. I'll take it off your hands. <laughs> well, I'd have to remind you that I'm still very much alive. And the idea is that you would get this watch when I when I die. And uh, but at the moment I'm I'm obviously <laughs> I'm using it. I use it every day. Um, but when I die, your time will come. <laughs> now I said that especially for Brian Davis. I think Brian Davis will enjoy that. When I die, your time will come. So let's try and keep on track here. Verse 18. This is why even the first covenant was not put into effect without blood. So we see that blood is mentioned a lot here. So spilt blood means that some someone or some creature has died. A death has taken place. So when we come across blood, it means death has taken place. Verse 19. When Moses had proclaimed every command of the law, <clears throat> excuse me, when Moses had proclaimed every command of the law to all the people, he took the blood of calves together with water, scarlet wool, with branches of hyssop, and sprinkled the scroll and all the people. He said, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you to keep. In the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tabernacle and everything used in its ceremonies. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And why? Because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. Isn't that a very important verse to take hold of? You see, if our sins deserve death, then we deserve to die. The Old Testament covenant, it basically stated that if you keep the law, keep this and you will live. You keep God's law, you will live. You will have eternal life. But, so, so like in any agreement, there's terms and conditions. And the terms and conditions are, if you keep it, you will live. But if you transgress and break the law, then you'll die. Just like this animal whose blood 
is being sprinkled here has been killed. Just like that animal has died, so will we die if we break the law. Of course, the truth is, as we found out, and it's very obvious in our own lives, every single one of us has broken God's law. Um, and we, we saw before, we've broken God's heart. But just keeping it in the symbolism, this uh, justice, this uh, these illustrations from the courts of law and justice, we see that the Old Testament law of uh, recompense or retaliation stated quite bluntly and harshly, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a life must be given for a life. That's seen in Deuteronomy 19.21. A life for a life. So God himself kept the justice of the law. He, he didn't wink at sin and oh, that's all right kind of a thing. No, the soul that sins deserves to die. But God himself, God the Son, he stepped in and he gave up his perfect life to save the lives of all mankind. It's amazing. A life did pay for our sins. A death did happen. Blood was spilt. And it was effective. And a life was given for your life. Isn't that incredible? Imagine that someone gave up their life for you. Uh, we've heard of um, stories in, in um, during the tough times of war. Uh, I think there was a story of um, a priest, Maximilian Colby, who had... Um, there was somebody going to be shot, somebody going to be killed, and he said, "I will, um, I'll take that for them," and um, and uh, he died so that somebody else could be spared, and that's what Jesus did for us. Jesus died so that we would be spared the wrath of God. Like God loves people, but God absolutely can't tolerate sin because he's holy and pure it's not that it's not that a preference he has it's simply that he is true and just and we often appeal for for justice but you know if god somebody has said it if if god really gave us justice we would all be wiped out um it's god gives us mercy and you know we who've received mercy may we be those who give mercy to other people, that we would treat other people with mercy, mercy. If we're ever tempted to be harsh and cruel towards people, no, no. Think about it. How did God treat us? He didn't treat us as our sins deserve. He gave himself for us. So let's take up again the text in verse 23. So again, this is Hebrews chapter 9, verse 23. It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices. But the heavenly things themselves were better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the, the true one. No, he entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again, the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood that's not his own. And ju just a side note on this, that if a sacrifice was really effective, it would never need to be repeated. And, and that's the real problem with religion, uh, with, any, with a religion that offers daily sacrifices. And there's, there's several religions that do. And if you're part of a religion that has to offer a daily sacrifice, then it's, it's not effective. Let's read on 26. It says, Otherwise, Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But you see, he has appeared once for all. Once for all. At the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face the judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. 
and he will appear a second time, but not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Well, we've got huge reasons to be joyful and thankful. Although we as humans, we're, we're going to die. We're going to die at one point in our lives. Um, at that point, we, we know that we can face God's judgment confidently. We can face God's judgment seat confidently. Um, again, not confidence because of our own goodness, but confidence that Jesus, our high priest, has fully paid and effectively paid for all of our sins. He did all that was necessary to bring us into that place that the what the most holy place represented the holy the most holy place of the tabernacle where the high priest went once a year that represented God's very presence and you, we saw in the old testament illustration people weren't allowed there even the the high priest was only allowed to go in once a year. That means for 364 days of the year, that place of God's presence, uh, there was no humans there. And yet now, because of our high priest, Jesus Christ, who's gone in, in reality, he went out of this dimension and into the courts of heaven. He went into the most holy place with his his victory he was able to say with my blood i have purchased men for god he was able to say on the cross i've done it it's finished i've done all that's necessary to bridge the gap between sinful humanity and a perfect holy god Imagine if we were to face our approaching deaths, having to face God and God's judgment seat with all of our sins and impurity. Imagine, imagine facing God with, with our sins. Who could stand? I, you understand why many people are really afraid of dying. Um, and so they should be, because we, we are conscious that our sins are, are very... Uh, lives are not perfect. How can we, how can we live eternally with a perfect God? It would be so so wrong. Our sense of justice um, just go goes against that. It mitigates against that. But we thank God that our sins have been forgiven. Imagine our sins have been forgiven, and so we can look forward to the day of our death, or the day of Jesus' second coming, not with fear of His wrath but with confidence and joy. So Jesus did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. So this is great news that when, when the Lord Jesus revisits the earth, when he comes the second time, um, and that's going to be a planned date in the future, it could be in the next minute, the next hour, the next year, the next decade, next century, but there is a definite scheduled time when, that the Father knows when Jesus Christ will revisit the earth. Uh, he will come again to judge the living and the dead, but also he will gather his chosen ones from around the world and he will take us to live with him in his everlasting kingdom. And that is something for us to really, really rejoice in. We're so delighted that that God didn't just leave us. It's, it's awful sometimes when somebody is left in a terrible state uh, with no one to help them. And with humanity, we have many, many problems. We've got poverty, hunger, corrupt governments, and uh, many problems. Uh, but our biggest problem is inside ourselves. Um, our biggest enemy is the sin inside ourselves. But thank God our biggest ally is bigger than our sin. God is far greater than our sin and his life is far greater and purer than, than any of ours and his one life, 
his one sacrifice as both priest and sacrifice was sufficient and completely sufficient to pay for every wrongdoing that we've ever done every horrible attitude every bad word he paid for it all and the great news is that he is our savior our redeemer our our high priest so let's continue to worship him you know it's interesting when we looked at the tabernacle and the temple Jesus revealed in John chapter 4 to um, not one of, of the people of Israel, but to a Samaritan woman, a person maybe outside the, the norms of, 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 religious under, of religious privilege in a way. And he revealed to her that the true worshippers will worship the God, neither on the mountain or, or there in, in Jerusalem necessarily, but they will worship the Lord, not, not outwardly, but they'll worship God in spirit and in truth. The true worshippers will worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. So let's continue to worship the Lord together in spirit and in truth. We're going to sing uh, What Can Wash Away Our Sins. It starts with your blood speaks a better word. Here we go. empty claim I've heard upon the earth speaks of righteousness for me and stands in my defense Jesus it's your blood what can wash what can wash away our sin what can make us whole again? Nothing but the blood, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Your powerful blood, Lord. What can wash us pure as snow? Welcome as the friend of God. Nothing but your blood, Lord, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Your cross testifies in grace, tells of the Father's heart to make a way for us. Now boldly we approach. Not by earthly confidence, it's only by your blood. And what can wash away our sin? What can make us whole again? Nothing but the blood, nothing but the blood.
What can make us whole again? Nothing but the blood, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can wash us pure as snow? Welcomed as the friend of God, nothing but your blood, King Jesus. Thank you for your blood. Thank you for your blood, Lord, that cleanses us, Lord. Oh, nothing but the blood. Nothing but the blood of King Jesus. Hi, church. I hope you have received God's word today. Um, I'm going to close this off in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. Thank you, God, that you speak to us, Lord, and that we have the Bible and the sermons online available for us to watch anytime, Lord. I pray, God, for this week, Lord. I pray, God, as your church, that we will receive your grace, your mercy, and your peace. And I thank you, Lord, for the restrictions that are lifting, Lord. I pray, God, that we will soon be able to meet again, Lord. And I also ask for the protection, Lord, of the church and those in Ireland, Lord, from COVID, Lord. I, I pray, God, that you will protect us, Lord, and that we won't have to go into another lockdown, Lord, but that they will be able to... We will be able to meet each other and pray together and just have time and fellowship together, Lord. I thank you, God, that you are with us, Lord, and help us, Lord, this week to walk in your truth and your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you, guys. Um, enjoy this week.